Hello, everybody. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 1 of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Today's guest is Susanna Smith. Susanna is an early childhood educator by trade. As a teacher trainer at the Helen Duran, she trained over 1,000 teachers in 17 countries, while she was also involved in quality assurance, curriculum development, and creating instructional guides for parents and teachers. In 2019, Susanna moved to the USA and started her own consulting service for online experts who want to streamline their education-based content and maximize their online course conversion and retention rates. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hey, everyone. Buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast, the one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit eflmagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Uh, Today's guest is Susanna Smith. Susanna, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you. (laughs) Great. And you're in Florida. Is that right? Am I right in saying? Yes. Yes. This is, I think, I think, Philip, this is one of the best places to be grounded, actually. I'm really grateful for being in Florida. Really? What, why is Florida so good? Now, I must say, I've never been to the US, so I don't know. I Well, I know, obviously, Florida is uh, alligators and swamps and uh, Miami Vice. Uh, <laughs> but what else is, and uh, Tony Montana and uh, all these things. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, tell me about Florida. Oh, you got the basics covered. But practically, I think this is one of my friends puts it that Florida is the whole five beer state. So we just do everything. You know, uh, I think the pandemic didn't affect the state as badly as many other places in the world. We still have the freedom, at least in the tiny little town where I live, we still have the freedom to be on the beach every day. We don't have the whole cabin fever thing going on. And people are really laid back here. And funnily enough, the numbers are not worse in terms of COVID. So I think it's really lucky that we can pretty much live a very similar life to the, you know, compared to the pre-pandemic era. <laughs> yeah, it sounds uh, sounds like a nice location to be locked down in. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how did you get to Florida? You're from Hungary originally. Tell me about the route to Florida. Yes, yes, that was it. That I, I'll do the short version, okay? <laughs> well, please make it as long as you as you need. Okay, so I yes, I was born and raised in Budapest, Hungary, and I actually lived in seventeen different countries in the past decade and a half. So I think I would qualify as a nomad officially. <laughs> and yes, I I moved to Florida because of love. My husband is American, and after him living with me in this, you know, whole gypsy lifestyle didn't work out so well for the two of us. We moved here and we settled down before the pandemic, which was really a lucky move, as I said. <laughs> and. 17 different countries uh, over how many years? About over 10 years, I would say. Uh, Asia, Europe, I, I don't expect you to name all the countries, but can you give us a, an idea? Yeah, of the interesting lived? one. So I worked uh, thanks to this wonderful company. Do I want to say the name? Today? Please do. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> I worked for the Helen Doron Educational Group, which is possibly the biggest educational franchise at the moment. It's definitely a market leader in ESL, uh, teaching uh, mostly children. But like lately in the past several years, they were shifting. All these kids are growing up, right? So we are shifting towards teaching um, teens and young adults. And as you can hear, I still talk 
like I'm part of that company because I, I was part of that company for 15 years and the traveling was part of the job that I had training the teachers and creating a curriculum and creating other types of content for them. At the same time, so I worked with Helen directly. It was a privilege, and I learned so much there. And that's how I ended up in these awesome, wonderful countries. Some of the most interesting ones were I lived for about 14 months. I lived in Istanbul and traveled all over Turkey when I ran the quality assurance team there for the kindergarten um, department. I also lived in Israel in and out periodically, South Korea, if we want to touch Asia, I was there for nine months, uh, more or less. And I only count those where I stayed longer than just a couple of weeks, right? And of course, beautiful countries in Europe that not many people know about, like Slovenia was my second home for a while, Croatia, Austria, Germany. So those are the interesting ones. <laughs> wow. So, so we, we definitely won't mention the uninteresting ones then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah, oh, so such uh, such such great countries, and yeah, Slovenia is often overlooked. But the the beauty yes. of Slovenia for its size is breathtaking. <laughs> yeah. So we won't uh, we won't go through. Oh, I've been there, and did you do this? But that that might take us the whole hour. But. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit more about your job working for Hell. Is it Duran? Is that Duran, the right way to? Yes, ah, okay. Duran. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. Because I, 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 uh, the company Helen Duran, they've done some advertising with EFL magazine. So yeah, please feel free to mention Helen Duran as much and uh, as I will. <laughs> but of course, you know, I'm from Ireland, so we have a name Duran, so it sounds like the same, but it's Duran. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, tell me about your job there. What you were doing? It was a real Cinderella story because I. The way I found them was very interesting. I, I got my bachelor's degree in the States with a scholarship and I went back home to Hungary and I kind of got infected with the progressive teaching methodologies that I learned in the States. And I saw a, a big billboard, Helen Duran, education for the young. And then it looked kind of nice. So I called in and the next week I was in a teacher training um, course, which just shook my world because as a troubled student for most of my life I was labeled as you know now you would call them special needs back then it wasn't that kind <laughs> in the 80s so I struggled with the traditional learning methods my whole life and that's why I became a teacher to help those kids and this was the perfect place because it's very very student centered, very student friendly. It's based on encouragement instead of, you know, blame and shame. And it's based on a lot of like how, how to bring the best out of the students instead of focusing on what they are not good at. So I fell in love with it and taught over a hundred kids for several years before Helen actually handpicked us trainers. She picks her own trainers and then she, we get trained as a trainer. And then the whole world opens up because the company is present in 36 countries. Maybe uh, that number is usually outdated because they have more by the time I announce it. But I think it's 36, 37 countries maybe. So as a trainer, you travel to the different locations and you do that kind of training that literally changed my life. So I was so happy doing that. And after a while, you know, you just feel that that you have done your best in a particular era of your life or in a particular job. And things started to shift for me, especially that I met my husband and and we started to, you know, plan a different life. And when I moved to the States, that part of that phase had to end to work for Helen in this particular role, but I loved every minute of it. <laughs> I, you got to travel, and I'm working with Helen herself. So you you said she obviously made a great impression on you. Absolutely. Absolutely. She's a fantastic entrepreneur, I have to tell you. Or now she's a huge company owner, right? But she started as a private ESL teacher, walking from house to house in her town where she moved to a foreign country, right? She fell in love, moved to another country and started teaching kids 
English as a private tutor. And this gigantic company, beautiful educational franchise grew out of that effort. So that's a real success story. And what did you learn from her? Wow, yes, plenty. I'm hesitating because there are so many things I could mention here. And we didn't prep this interview, which is awesome in a way. (laughs) And uh, the first thing I want to say here is that she never worried about the competition. Like she just knew that people would copy her and she almost took it as a compliment. She's like, ah, that's awesome. (laughs) People think there is value in what I do because they try to, you know, replicate it. That's one thing. And the reason why she wasn't really worried about competition, because all she tried to focus on is how to stay ahead, how to stay a few steps ahead of everybody. And that's where all the effort went instead of try to compete with others. And that was a huge lesson for me that I learned from her kind of a hidden curriculum because I wasn't there as a as a business owner or entrepreneur. I was there as a, someone on a contract who worked for her as a teacher trainer, but I watched everything else happening. And this was so impressive. Okay. So don't, don't, don't care about the competition, just uh-huh. your own excellence. Yes. Focus on, on what, what you're doing. If people want to cop, that's, that's a fear entrepreneurs have is that somebody's going to steal their magic yes. formula and they're going to do it. But uh, for Helen, fear. that was not a fear. Uh, the teacher training trumped everything. Seriously, that was the heart and soul. And and if you have all the different uh, parts that are holding up uh, an ESL business, right? You have the materials, right? You have the 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 business part figured out. You have you have all the different elements, but the teacher training is not as brilliant as as the Helen Duran teacher training courses are then the heart and soul is sort of missing because everybody can create the most beautiful materials, completely up to date, you know, technological uh, amazement can be present. But if there is no methodology behind it, then it's not going to mean that much, especially in language teaching. So the methodology and the way how they trained the teachers, I think that was their secret sauce. Okay. And for you, you you worked there, and and when you you left, but I'm sure you're still on very good terms and, and stay in touch. But you you left, and what happened then? Ah, uh, yes, I got onto the entrepreneurial roller coaster, which I thought at that time, you know, when when you start out, that's the whole Dunning Kruger uh, chart. Uh, you are at the top of Mount Stupid, seriously. Like I had the most amount of confidence with the least amount of experience. <laughs> and then you sort of like get down the slope and reality hits. Like it's not going to be that easy and your first idea may not work. So I I went through a couple of really interesting ideas of what kind of consulting I could provide while I'm in the U.S. And it was also an interesting time because I was married to an American citizen, but I had to wait for the whole green card process to go through. So I had to be very careful who I work with, how I how I stay completely legal and uh, and very, you know, eligible for living here. So that was a juggling act. But once I got my green card, I started consulting mostly teachers about how to step-by-step build up a service that actually works for them and for their clients. Because by then I built up a pretty nice clientele and I could actually teach them the same process. By trade, I wanted to add this, I'm a curriculum designer and, and a compulsive course creator, completely, absolutely into that whole thing. I'm a curriculum creator nerd. I read all the research and everything around that topic. So what I realized that a lot of times there were content elements that were missing, like they had a good idea. They had a, obviously the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial fever, but teachers are not trained like I wasn't trained in business. I had to figure so many elements out for myself. So that's what I started to pass on to teachers in a one-on-one uh, consulting setting. That was the 
the very first successful attempt about two years ago. <laughs> okay, and I really want to go into that. That's okay. But um, there's, I just want to rewind a little bit, and with, which I can, uh, and I actually came up with a, a nice analogy. So I think the whole starting out in entrepreneurship, there's the always say the hope and the bravado, isn't there? It's like I can do this and. Uh, and then reality begins to set in, doesn't it? We think we can yes. get some quick re- wins, but actually it's a, it's a long slog, isn't it? it? And the analogy I was thinking of, if you've ever seen the uh, documentary, um, what is it, When We Were Kings about uh, Muhammad Ali, and it, when he's fighting George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle, I think it was in 1975. But uh, if you haven't watched it or... If the listeners haven't watched it, you should really watch it. It's, it's a fantastic documentary, um, inspiring, of course, anything with Ali is. But uh, as well, part in the first round, Ali's, uh, according to Norman Mailer, anyway, his, his whole game plan was to hit uh, Foreman with an overhand right. So this is not something that's normally uh, thrown in a fight. It's, it's seen as a bit of an insult, and it's something that's you know, not expected. So he was to go out, he was to throw this overhand right, try to get Foreman down on the ground, didn't work. And he came out and he was like, oh, against the ropes for, I don't know, how many rounds? Six, seven rounds? And then eventually Foreman were out and he was able to come back and hit him. But, you know, entrepreneurship's a bit like that. We're at the beginning. We think we can get all this, but actually we're sometimes against the ropes, aren't we? And we have to take soak up the punishment for, for a long time. Yes, absolutely. And as I refer to the whole Dunning-Kruger chart, when, when you know, there is this height of the beginning and you need that enthusiasm, honestly, like change and starting something new is scary. You need all those good hormones in your system and the the whole you know like that momentum but then it's inevitable to go down Seth Godin calls this the dip yeah and you have to go through that dip and what's hard to understand that it's necessary for the next step nobody can skip the dip or I haven't heard anyone who did right so that's what we need to understand that it's a part of the whole game right finding yourself against the rope you cannot play you cannot box or play anything without expecting that to ever happen, right? So that's not possible. And it's really interesting to see the psychological shifts first in myself and then in everybody else when that happens. Like, how do you go through all that? That's the interesting question. A lot, of, a bunch of people use this analogy. I think Stephen Covey uses it and he calls it the valley of despair. And then the slope of enlightenment when you crawl out of it, actually, with a lot more information and understanding and experience yes exactly and it it takes me back to the when i was uh starting out and actually i was uh, contacting a lot lot of people on linkedin and uh, you know getting people to write and uh, just uh, trying to get people interested in business owners as well and some of the email I, i just look at some of the message messages i sent and they're cringeworthy I, that's all i can say is i had all this sort of bravado and i was like well in one year i'm going to achieve this and uh of course it didn't happen but what what i really f- don't want to be like i don't i i didn't become cynical i at least i hope so um and actually i see some people in in social media land and they have that same kind of bravado but uh i actually would not like to meet these people for the simple reason is I just wouldn't want to bring them down. You know, I wouldn't want to say one of these people, well, I tried that didn't work. And I don't know how I would not do that. You know, I would, I would like to give them a little dose of reality, but you have to balance the reality with the enthusiasm, as you say. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And yes, then, you know, you do meet those people in the different stages and you can tell from the comments and their reactions where they are at. A lot of times when when things don't work out, people get skeptical and bitter about it and they repeating the blanket statements like the market is oversaturated and you cannot do make a living out of this and all that. And you hear that and you go like, okay, you have to go through this phase. The question is, are you going to continue or not? That's it. Like, will you just stick to it or not? That's it. And that's the difference. I I think Richard Brunson said this, like, just don't quit is the only rule <laughs> that you have for success. 
that's the most important one that you have to get through that phase too. And if you stick to it and you figure out and tweak it according to what actually needs to be tweaked, which is interesting to see what the actual thing you need to change, then you, eventually you're going to get it right. Yes, that's the hope. And that's the promise. <laughs> let's let's hope so. I think Woody Allen said that is something similar, didn't he? He said that most of success is just turning up. Yes. Yeah. And so it's interesting that Richard Branson says a, a, a similar thing. So, okay, we're at the beginning. We, we've had the, we're going, we're sliding down into the valley of despair. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> tell me a little bit what, what you learned from, from Seth Godin and uh, how, how it re- related to. I actually read yeah. that book after I went through my own val- valley of despair. It was. Interesting because first I tried to create a business that had zero demand. <laughs> I, I wanted to create a burnout service, like help teachers get out of burnout. But I realized that most teachers have no idea that they are, you know, in that phase and they have burnout issues. They had no clue that they needed what I offered because they haven't registered their issues the way how I named them and what I wanted to help them with. And it's like, the, I, I heard sentences like, yeah, I need half a bottle of wine every evening, but I don't think I have a burnout issue. Like then, you know, when that's not connected, it's really hard to build anything around that. So I gave up on that first. That was my first big dip, I believe, if I want to be completely authentic. And then I shifted to helping people like creating a service around the right kind of stuff and how to actually create the content both free and paid but mostly i focused as a curriculum designer on the paid content which actually attracts and retains the type of students that they want to have and that seemed to be a very good track and then covid comes which was a dip for everybody right (laughs) double dip yeah (laughs) exactly Mm. it's like a dip for the planet (laughs) yes but uh uh, things are Somewhat again, getting back to normal. I see things are opening up in Europe yes. a little bit. Uh, of course, here in in Japan, it's uh, I think something like f- only four percent of the population have been vaccinated so far. So, yeah. um, I know my friend the same age as uh, as me uh, back home and in, in Ireland, and he's getting vaccinated. But I think it might be a few months off for me uh, yet. Uh, so yeah, so you went through the the dip. And tell me more about the business of helping PE, where you finally found success or how you found yes. traction, let's say. In, in, yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. As I said, the pandemic was like a double whammy for a lot of us. Yeah. You, you said the same thing that it just threw us on a loop. And at the time when the pandemic hit, I was actually starting a company that I, I actually was asked to join a group to start a company called the Teaching Community. And we created a couple really wonderful courses to help people teach online and set this service thing up. Yeah, like how does that work and how to think in systems because I'm a, I'm an organizational freak. Like I have to have everything systematized. And I love how... That I, I really love how that fits into what you do as a private teacher or a solo entrepreneur or, you know, maybe a small learning center or learning studio because I used to be an owner of one that that served kids for a couple years as well. So that started to flourish, but the pandemic kind of caught everything for us as well. The company is being dissolved right now. This is the first place where I officially announce it. <laughs> And I love being authentic about it because these things happen and 80% of the companies don't make it in their original form, right? So so I think that's just how reality works. And I have zero uh, regrets around it. The lessons we learned were enormous. And the fact is that what we tried to do before the pandemic got outdated in the meantime, like a lot of other things did. So we're taking a new direction, and I'm going to be very happy to talk about that next. <laughs> yes, certainly. We'd, we'd, uh, and uh, I'll be moving on to that in just a second. But you, you did mention systems thinking and building systems yes. in companies. Now, this is something we chatted with uh, 
when this podcast goes out, <laughs> it will be a couple of weeks ago, with um, Christina Rebuffet. And she talked about getting a system in her company, uh, getting an employee manual, streamlining. Um, so tell me about systems, designing systems. This is <laughs> up your alley, I think. Yes, it's kind of like, to me, it's an offshoot from curriculum design, which is highly systematic, right? And I know curriculum design in general gives a lot of people the chills because it doesn't have a good reputation. It usually is like some huge document that you have to produce that's full of foreign words and you need a dictionary to get through and everybody falls asleep reading it, right? That's kind of like the old school stereotype of like curriculum design but the way how we create the curriculum is actually highly systematic simple and very intentional and you can the heart of every system is pretty much the same that you have to find the right order of applying particular pragmatic steps yes and it's also quite individual depending on what system you're working on what those steps are but having the right direction, understanding where you where your starting point is and where your finish line is, usually my style, if you like, is to start with the end in mind and reverse engineer everything from that. That's how we design our curriculum or whatever content piece we're working on. And that's how we de design our systems. We would like to see the positive outcome or the desired result or whatever you want to call it for you know a, a successful student pathway it would be their thriving future identity who do they want to become all that journey stuff that we learn about in business books <laughs> and then you reverse engineer it step by step getting to the point where you are right now and see what fills in that bridge and that's the same for system design at least in my understanding and for curriculum design as well Okay, and you mentioned the you mentioned earlier about uh, let's say learning difficulties. Is it um, yes in, in in students? And you mentioned oh, a little bit about yourself um, yeah. and and your history. So also taking into account uh, Richard Branson, who himself ha 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 does have uh, uh, dyslexia, for example. Yes. So he and a lot of uh, you know, successful people, they say dyslexia is actually an advantage for them. So yes. for you and being, let's say, nerdy about your uh, your systems design, was it actually your background? Was it a, an asset to you in in this way of thinking in, in your entrepreneurial journey? Well, I developed this as a survival mechanism, literally, because in school I was drowning nonstop. I couldn't pay attention. I was fidgety. I couldn't sit still. Uh, those things were dreadful, especially I, I'm, it was a different era when we were in, you know, in the 80s and 90s when I was in my school years mostly. And also we still had a very different, you know, political system. <laughs> so a lot of rules were reinforced quite ruthlessly, to be honest, and kids who didn't fit in suffered. But I think that's also a global phenomenon that happens in any school system, where the first two things that you have to learn is what? Be quiet, sit still. Yeah. So that didn't work for me. And the only way, because my brain goes usually 100 miles per hour and it's way ahead of everything else that I'm trying to say, I had to create the systems for myself to be able to actually get through those school years because there was no special education available where I come from. So they just literally, you know, called me different kind of not kind names and sent me home and told my mom that I was hopeless. And that was it. That was all the help we got. So I literally taught myself to think in systems so I can fit in the one system that yeah, I had to get through just to graduate. <laughs> yes, uh, it, it does ring a bell growing up in Ireland in the 80s. It, it, right. it, was, it, was, it was similar. There was uh, 
I, I mean, if I can say the unkind words, what what do we call ADHD now? The teachers yeah. would say something like, "Your person is just spaced out" or something. You know, that's yes. what they used to say. Or you're a spacer or something. That's, yeah, that's space cadet. <laughs> yeah, space cadet. Yes, exactly. Um, so we're glad those things have changed. Uh, yes, for the better. It sounds a little bit like uh, I'm sure you're aware of John Taylor Gatto. Have you ever read his books? And uh, he talks about something similar about, you know, students being corralled into classrooms and there's bells and uh, as yeah. a, a curriculum, sorry. And there's a, you know, there's the strict discipline and how this was yes. brought from the, the, the Prussian system. Is is that kind of similar to Yes, what you're yes, getting I guess at, a yeah. lot of us have that experience, but because we take it as a norm, we don't question it anymore. What was that system created for originally? Practically, to to uh, in my understanding, and I heard this from other entrepreneurs. Obviously, like Seth Godin talks about this a lot, or or James Wedmore, how it was practically to produce, uh, created to produce employees or factory workers or those people who are who do what they are told to do, right? But it's funny enough that the entrepreneurs who are the most successful now never fit in that system. They had to create their own system to thrive because that didn't fit their way of being or or their their way of thinking. And then they had to obviously overcome the fact that they were labeled there often as, you know, stupid, hopeless, or some more elegant ones of hyperactive or ADHD or the disorders and everything else. But it's a disorder f- from their point of view only, right? Like that that is such an interesting, you know, spin that I had on it. Like, wait a minute, maybe it is a good thing that I didn't fit in that system because do I want to be the perfect factory worker? No. <laughs> And I'm sure growing up in Hungary in the 80s, was that, uh, it was coming to the end of, uh, you know, the yes. communist era in Hungary. But yeah. I think it, you you will correct me if I'm wrong, but Hungary was not hardcore as maybe other Eastern Bloc countries. Yes. Is, is that I true? I think we were like the happiest part of the Bloc, as we called ourselves, you know, usually quite laid back and bohemian, but still the restrictions apply. Like we couldn't leave the country together. My whole family couldn't go, just half of the family. So they ensure that we come back. And I remember these things in my childhood obviously it didn't affect me as a kid as much as it would have if I were a grown up in a in a country, the political system was less important, but the, I know the rules are very, were very strict and you kind of had like a life path laid out in front of you pretty much clearly from, I would say, sixth to, or seventh grade. And you had to do a lot to change that, which I did because eventually the hopeless kid turned into a teacher trainer. So that was obviously not what they predicted for me in high school. <laughs> And and all the the badly behaved kids are now teachers, and they're getting yes. they're getting it in the neck from the students. So you know what goes around comes around. Yeah, I, I, I'm not way, speaking yes. of anyone in particular here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So that's that's kind of your background. It's uh, it's fascinating to hear that and and your Thank motivation. You. So the the fact that you know you didn't fit in, and you were always seen as a bit of an anomaly or Let's let's say the semi unkind oddball. Not calling you oddball, but you know that's what. Uh, oh, you're welcome to. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think so. Well, I, I've always been called oddball as well. My, you know, so uh, I think it's uh, it's a good word. But yeah, so you weren't the you weren't the the model the model prisoner the model factory worker, no. and you needed to do something yourself. So you went out on your own and. You 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 were able to use your background and uh, your difficulties to your advantage. Absolutely, like in when I worked with Helen, I used it to be able to create programs and and courses, participating in teamwork. I was never on my own with that. To literally keep in mind how these different children learn differently and how they need different types of input how they need different kinds of materials and different style of teaching 
so actually they can participate and enjoy and take something home from it. And that was at the forefront of our minds all the time. That was the the whole idea behind this entire teaching methodology that Helen started and then uh, so many of us joined, you know, to create more and more beautiful things in there for those who didn't fit into the regular systems. So that was like the best education I could have. And now I'm thinking about how to apply all that, or I'm constantly trying to apply all that knowledge, that background in my consulting services. So I think that's a very rich and beautiful background to lean on. And I can help whatever you are teaching, whatever subject matter you're teaching, I can definitely help you make it more student friendly, more aligned with everything else that you do. And the content to me is a key element. And I mean, both paid and free content. And what's really interesting about COVID, Philip, I think that a lot of things shifted when the online teaching arena became this incredibly crowded space and everything exploded, right? And a lot of old trends, which I would say are trends from 2017 and 2018, before COVID started, they don't work anymore. But those ideas are still flying around all over in this hyperspace. And it's really hard to decipher and decide what's for you now. And what's not, because honestly, we don't have that much experience yet with this whole boom that's happening right now. Did okay. I see the conversation in a completely different direction? Uh, not at all. Not at all. You're making my, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm still a kind of neophyte here, uh, podcaster, but I think I can handle it. Uh, but you. I just wanted to go back uh, to the point where you, you, you mentioned your old business or the business that is. Uh, yes. You know, I'm trying to find some kind of euphemism here. So, uh, yeah, so it's been di- oh, discontinuing a business. To, yeah, yeah, we are trying yeah. to kill that business, and I don't need any, you know, any kind statements around that. It okay. just doesn't work the way I worked anymore. And I think saying that out loud is actually empowering instead of trying to like either hide it or try to push it forward just so we don't have to feel like failures. I think it's a very good idea to assess. Again, assessment is one of my, you know, strongholds. Assess what works and what doesn't. Be able to decide what to put your energy in and time and and money in and then continue with that. So (laughs) there is no nothing to hide here. It's also like reframing mistakes, I believe, which comes from the educational background. All of us kind of stigmatized mistakes. And Sir Ken Robinson, who is unfortunately not with us anymore, he talks about this in some of his very famous speeches. And and he, he writes about this a lot, how mistakes are stigmatized throughout their entire education. And whatever you learn that early in your life sinks in really deep, right? So reframing and rewiring all that, like looking at what went wrong and using it very differently than you know, as a reason to feel shameful or apologize. That's really an interesting way. And I think a lot more useful way to move forward because then you can use all that information. It's like the whole Edison principle, right? Like how many ways he had to discover when the light bulb didn't work before (laughs) he actually got to the right solution. And without those, it would have never come to this point, right? So So if you look at the entire journey like that and see every single element is necessary for the growth and not resisting it and feeling shameful about it and try to disown and deny and suppress and not to deal with it and hide it, I do believe that's the way how we get the most out of it, if that makes sense. No, absolutely does. And it's I I think reframing has been... And an NLP as well, yes. isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, um, they coined it. Yes. Yes, uh, they, they they talk about it. Yeah, and 
exactly for, with with students and that is so much a thing here in japan with education oh uh, gosh in yes. general you know making a mistake is the is the worst thing possible but of course the upside is if you want to make the best tvs and radios and uh, electronic equipment you know you go korea japan china now and uh, you know the no mistakes and uh you know, not not compromising on quality. That's it's a plus. But for normal life, I don't know, or for learning, being frozen to the spot because of the fear of making mistakes is yes. is is a real is a real thing. And how do you f- find that? Because you you were in Korea and and different countries and U.S. Uh, culturally, you know making mistakes as as a student or as a teacher or as an entrepreneur how how do you see the attitude there that's a very good question thank you i think like globally because the education systems are so similar to each other at their core with their purpose of what kind of good student they try to create i think we pretty much have a very similar spin on mistakes how do we handle it later and what we do with it, you know, when we try to take matters, matter in our own hands and, and, and process it differently? That, the question is, I think, if you have that consciousness or not, and I know I'm using some woo-woo terms here, but you can also call it progressive psychology, right? So if you think about how you think about your own processes and to learn that skill, now more and more education systems start to discover that that is as important as teaching kids data about dead kings, right? So this is really interesting to see those shifts. And uh, I know there are huge differences between the cultures. Yes, that, that is definitely an influencer. And these newer trends take a long while to kind of set foot and stay. But I am hopeful that there is a new trend everywhere. I mean, Helen Duron is in South Korea. That's a good thing <laughs> because it completely goes against their original, you know, educational principles of like making it easy for the children, making it playful. When you have these deep rooted beliefs that learning has to be hard and they must feel horrible during learning because that's how I felt and my parents felt and their parents felt and it needs to be a struggle then it's really hard to you know root a new belief which is learning is fun learning is playful learning is easy and it works so that's the hope that the small little things that happen the shifts will actually change the major trends eventually did that answer your question Ah yes, certainly. And I wanted to move on as as you you introduced uh, the new area. You said you you said you slightly went off on a tangent there, but yes. um, I'd like to follow that now. So you. you're at your we we talked about your your previous company, and now what are you doing now? And what's yeah. your plans? Yes, actually, I. I'm very proud that I got hired as a coach uh, by a company that's called Screw the 9 to 5. So Oh, good good name. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh you can look them up everybody who is listening because they are so much fun to work with. They have 460 podcast episodes that are full of value and uh we run these boot camps and we usually have over 1000 people at a time. So there I started to collect a lot of of information about right uh, about entrepreneurs mostly and my focus shifted to people who are less of teachers by trade but more of teachers by choice because anything you try to sell online nowadays even if it's a physical product if it, it's the mug that the listeners cannot see because I'm holding it up <laughs> But you want to teach something about that first before you sell it, right? So everybody is a teacher who is an entrepreneur. They just have to recognize their own teaching abilities and they have to be able to kind of uh, live up to that and be trained very, very fast. Often they are self-trained people. They learn 
how they teach about their product so it's being successful. What why why not to help them with that? You know, why not to help them on that journey? So with that quite big sample, and this is not exactly the focus of the boot camps. In the boot camp, we practically help you create um, a, an outline of a signature program. That's that's the whole point over there for mostly course creators and coaches. That's the profile. But because I have such a huge sample coming in and I have to give them feedback on their content structure and process real time while they are actually doing the process, I kind of started to collect what problems they are struggling with. And one of the things that come up regularly is what exactly should they put in their free content versus their paid content? And what's the best way to deliver that? where to deliver it, how much to put it. Oh my gosh, the how much question is one of the biggest ones. And most of us make the huge mistake. Lovely course creators, lovely educators, and lovely experts to stuff way too much into one piece of content or one lesson or one course or one module compared to how much people can actually con- consume and mostly the most important question, <clears throat> excuse me, is how much can they actually apply and make useful, right? So this is where we try to find the balance in that particular segment of their journey and their business, how to create that balance and alignment in the content creation. <laughs> yeah, and it's it, it's it, it's interesting that you you mentioned people try to stuff too much into a course. Oh, yes. It's it's a little bit like feature creep, isn't it? With uh-huh. companies, they just, they put on these bells and whistles and features that people don't know about or won't use or are not useful for them. And they do a lot of research and development and they, you know, they go, go in the wrong areas. But I, I find that myself. I think a lot of people do is we, we say, okay, to make something of value, we have to do more yes. and work harder. And just, to, you know, we, we do one thing and we we decide to branch off in, in different areas or, you know, we elaborate too much on, yes. on what, what we're all already doing. So tell me about that. That's interesting that other people also struggle with that. Oh, I think almost everybody I've met, especially the lovely experts who are full of passion about their expertise, let it be a skill set, a know-how, or, you know, something that they teach to others. And the, especially if they're not teachers by trade, they never learned lesson design or course design, or they have no idea what ratios should be there. And the first thing that you do, especially if it's something, a subject you know a lot about and is passionate about, then you flood people with information, right? And often it's unstructured or not structured, right? And then because everybody's running for the hills, you go like, oh, I probably don't provide enough. Let me put more in there. <laughs> yeah, people want more information all the time, more Obviously, information. But yeah. it's that's not the problem. That's not the original problem. Another PDF is not going to fix the course that's structured wrong. That's yes. my point here. <laughs> but I, I think the... the, the uh, I won't go into pop psychology here, but the a, a lot of the roots of this kind of thing is you think it's not good enough, so you just need exactly. to do more, isn't it? Whereas that's not it. You hit the nail on the head with that. It's like a whole imposterism topic that we could digress. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't. I think maybe we can do it in another episode. But yeah, no well, the only reason I won't is because uh, I yeah. for the first five episodes we we talked about imposter syndrome and so i was like okay i'm not going to mention imposter syndrome again let's talk about pricing and this is something we all struggle with yes yes that's true and me too i i absolutely understand that what i see is that there are trends out there and we all hear them it's like premium pricing will attract very different customers than, you know, when you undercut. And especially in the ESL era, I think, or English uh, as a second language territory on the Internet, there is a lot of like 
you know, red ocean f- phenomenon when people try to undercut each other and, and, and there is a lot of competition going on. And often it brings out insecurities. I'm not going to use the other I word, okay? <laughs> uh, the whole imposter syndrome around pricing, I just said that, but I don't want to talk about it in detail, is practically that we don't have any training on how to price objectively, right? Which is already an interesting quest on its own because pricing, how can pricing be entirely objective? Like seriously, what would you base it on? So the whole idea is that you get into a space where you can actually get as detached from the insecurities and detached from what the competitors competitors do and kind of have a very doable strategy with, I think, incremental increase. That would be a good idea for someone who is just starting out. Like after a few people, you can always increase your prices. And that's what I was doing at the beginning. And that sort of works better than, you know, trying to listen to a, a, a podcast, for example, I'm not talking about yours, that boosts your self-esteem, like saying, like, charge what you're worth and put uh, taxes to it. And and I'm like, look, careful there, because then you're going to attach your self-worth to a price that you kind of come up with because you want to, you know, boost your own self-esteem. Like, what kind of strategy is that? <laughs> That's true. And that's something Seth Godin talks about, isn't it? Yes. Uh, he he, he yes. talks about, uh, you know, not uh, mirroring your self-worth in, in your business, isn't it? It's not. It, so basically yes. what you do and, and the same in it, he talks about education as well, doesn't he? Absolutely. Plenty of times. Exactly. I really like his spin on these. Uh, he's an excellent source of information and he's very generous with his information. And uh, yeah, sometimes I listen to the same thing a couple times because or read the same book a couple times for that reason. But I think what we are trying to hit on here is that practically if you cannot stand behind your own prices, whatever those prices are, it's not going to work. And you have to play your own game. I had to play my own game of like overpricing and underpricing. And I don't know it's overpriced until it doesn't work or it's underpriced until it, you know, attracts the wrong people. So that's like a something that's a balancing act that as solo entrepreneurs, we, we all have to find our footing and bearing, you know, in. and I think mistakes here are also necessary at the beginning. And it's it's not it's trial and error, but it's also measurable. It's it's yes. uh, it's something that, for for example, in uh, in Amazon, they say you know there's a sweet spot for the price of the book, isn't there? When you put yes. your, I still have a book on Amazon if anyone wants to see it there, uh, but I think it's languishing somewhere. But uh, yeah, they they always say you know. Uh, there's a, there's a graph, isn't there? And once you go above five dollars, your the likelihood of sales will go down, or they will reduce by a certain percentage. And if it's above ten dollars, it'd be so much. But um, yeah, so that's one thing about pricing. But also, uh, what Christina uh, talked about a, a few weeks ago was that it, so some concrete examples were when she priced one of her courses above five hundred dot will say dollars but five hundred dollars the people uh weren't so you know the the number of people signing up was not so high but when she went below let's say the early tw- the early 400s uh sales took off and there, there's a psychological barrier maybe about the the number five i'm maybe you can give uh, some, some tips on that but yeah so as, somehow we think 500 is uh well, it is quite a substantial amount of money but 500 but 400 maybe seems a little bit more you know affordable i say. believe but, it also depends on the audience largely yeah. And what brains they are using when they are, obviously, we all make an emotional decision when we buy something primarily, right? And then we justify it with logic. But at the same time, I do believe in, like, this is why it's hard to give, like, pricing advice universally. Uh, And I also never learned this in school. So here comes my imposterism (laughs) that I can share with you what I learned 
uh, by trial and error and what I see other people do who I work with and what works and what doesn't work. And I think it's highly subjective and it needs to be tailored to who you're working with as well. Are they more like logical and they base their decisions on that? What will appeal to them? How will they react to the different prices? And this is something that a beginner, like having that beginner mindset is a very good idea. Obviously, a lot of the listeners have had businesses for years and they have their pricing structure set already, right? So we are mostly, when we're talking about how to price things, we are talking to the newcomers. Am I right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, pricing. But I I think uh, for people who are already in business, maybe looking to diversify, um, yes. in certain maybe some people are into consulting and they would like to perhaps uh, sell courses, for example. Yes, that's a yes. scaling. Area. Yes, that's yes. a big buzzword too. <laughs> yes, exactly. And we could talk about the books there, Nail It and Scale It. Is it Scale It? And na- no, Nail It and Scale It is not one of That's the, the right order, books. I think. Yes. Yeah, I think that's the one. Yeah, Nail, nail It and Scale It. But I, I think you, you touched on something quite interesting there as well, which was... Uh, a reading books for entrepreneurs, and I used to be, let's say, more voracious reader, and I would read maybe one, two books a week. And I, I think I, I got some advice from Schopenhauer actually, and nice. Schopenhauer said uh, he gave five tips for reading books, and he he said to only read five books. But but I'll come back to this in a second. But basically, what Schopenhauer said was that you know people just read books and they just forget them, throw them away. He said, read a book and reread it and read the passages. So this is really what you're saying about uh, set go then, wasn't it? So you don't have to have a whole bookshelf of business books or education books. Get one book and just read it and just every day go back and reference it, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's a very different level of knowledge when you kind of know about something and when you can actually apply it, right, and use it and 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 have the whole thing working and, and come alive in what you're doing, that's a very different thing. And we could talk about this all day with teachers, how there's a huge difference. And you see this in a classroom or you see this in a, in a group or you see it between your individual students where they are on that journey. If they are, they have no clue from the no clue phase to the beautiful application phase when they actually using it actively right so it's the same for us <laughs> yes exactly and it, we we don't really apply the knowledge we already have and then we read another book and say oh i read about that before and then suddenly the the penny drops but it's because we didn't read the first book well enough or we didn't review it and yes, yes. but he he also does say as an aside um, some of the books to read are the books that are least popular probably with audience nowadays so for example don quixote which is quite difficult to get through and Tristram Shandy as well, which is quite difficult to get through. But he, so how can people get in contact with you uh, if they want to work with you and uh, know more? Thank you. Thank you very much. Like I wholeheartedly recommend to check out this through the 9to5 website. And my own personal website is jujannasmith.com. It's very simple. I offer my one-on-one services there. Anybody can book a coffee chat with me. I'm very happy to hear about their business and what they are struggling with in terms of content creation, curriculum creation, how to align what you do when you talk about your content with what you do actually in your courses. And my keywords are uh, retention and sustainability because we also have to keep our own sanity while we are creating and, and serving, right? So... Those are very important principles, and I'm very happy to have a conversation with anybody who is interested, and we will figure out how to work together. (laughs) And the spelling of your name as well, that's important. So Z-S-U-Z-S-A-N-N-A. Smith. I don't have to spell Smith. No, you don't have to spell. I think most people know that one, don't they? (laughs) So, um, So, yeah. And of course, the proper pronunciation of your name, I, I, Ju, Jujana. 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 
<laughs> it's always entertaining to hear people trying. And I love that you try so hard. Thank you, Philip. It was great talking to you today. And as we say, Jujana as Smith Z. Uh, I'll go for the Z here. Yes, um, sure. Z S U Z A N N A S M I T H. Not not with a Y. You know, it could be with a Y, couldn't it? Um, dot com. And uh, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out eflmagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.